Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you well. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next session will be given by uh, still by uh, Dr. Premulando, so I don't need to introduce him again. So let's start uh, the second session of uh, introduction to astroparticle and uh, particle dark matter. So please, Dr. Primulando. Okay, thank you very much. I believe I have shared my screen right now. Um, and these are the, the two papers that discuss about the um, about the, um, the, the, the upper bound on the dark matter. Of course, uh, you know, for dark matter as heavy as 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the t uh, a thousand of the, uh, um, the, the sun mass, uh, it would uh, probably uh, black holes, crumble black holes. So uh, this paper is interested in that. Also the second one, this is kind of, I think 85 and this is 2007. So um, you can check these papers for the, uh, uh, for the upper bound of the, the dark matter. Um, upper bound and dark matter mass. So, yeah, um, so to, yeah, somebody asked me the question uh, uh, earlier. So, yeah, so then we can move on. So I, I'll just make a kind of brief comments about this, um, um, about this uh, when uh, freeze out. Um, uh, the comment is the, uh, what I did before uh, was the back to the info calculation. I just remember I can take uh, I can put like you know the pi's the uh, the you know the 45 uh, here is uh, to be one yeah, because you know I just say uh, the rate is kind of equal to Hubble constant uh, uh, yeah Hubble parameter at a time so everything is back to the Hubble equation but um, in reality uh, we don't have to well we we cannot just use the back to the Hubble equation we really have to solve the Boltzmann equation that uh, Dr. Wandari uh, showed. Uh, Yesterday, um, this is the Boltzmann equation. Like basically, you have to solve this differential equation. Oops, uh, you do you track the uh, you know the number of the dark matter as a function of the t and its function. Uh, there is Hubble constant here or uh, Hubble parameter, um, and then NAQ is the uh, the equilibrium uh, density uh, that we calculate uh, earlier. Um, and this uh, sigma v, sigma is the cross section, and you multiply it by the, by the velocity, average velocity. Um, it's given by this uh, this expression. Um, you know, t is the temperature. Um, as uh, s is the uh, there is one parameter that you haven't seen here. S is the uh, uh, definition in particle physics. It's basically uh, four times uh, center of mass energy. Uh, no, if they send the mass energy, then it's not four times, it's just send the general mass energy. Um, yeah, PCM squared. Um, so the, the this cross section should be a function of the center of mass energy. So you, uh, you plug in sigma is function of S. And then K1 and K2 are just simply Bessel function. Of, uh, this equation looks um, crazy, um, it's horrendous, uh, but uh, it is really, it really is horrendous. I, I, for my third paper, as you know, stupid lowly grad students, I had to solve these uh, equations, and uh, yeah, uh, it was using Mathematica. I think it's like even using that, it was kind of painful because you know, uh, the, you sigma v is a function of temperature, but the time here is a function of temperature. Hubble parameter is also a function of temperature, and everything here is function of temperature, but they are not linear, so it's kind of painful to solve this equation. Luckily, um, if you really want to go into this, um, they are out of package uh, out there, um, like Micromegas or MathDM. Uh, so if you have specific particle physics model, you can just go in and then uh, just, just download this uh, and then uh, solve this uh, Boltzmann equation. Um, Numerically, they what they do is numerically, but uh, then you really don't have to solve this difference equation yourself. You just use this, this package, and then uh, you are good to go. Um, so, uh, and to be good, uh, to, it's even better because this package can also calculate the detection, 
can help calculate under, uh, the cross section for under detections and and other stuff as well. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just uh, info for you. So uh, in case one day you really want to work on this uh, subject, you you don't have to go to the pain of uh, solving this Boltzmann equation. Really painful, trust me. Um, okay, um, so let me just pick pick. Uh, so uh, for us to to have a continuous story, let us pick a benchmark model. Um, for you, this is probably the only slide for you, particle physicists. That you, if you, if there is any particle physics here, um, this is a Lagrangian. So basically, um, when you say in particle physics, if you set a Lagrangian, basically you tells the you, it tells you the interaction of the uh, the model. Oops. Um, sorry, I. Uh, ah, yeah. Okay. Um, the interaction of the the the, um, the 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 model. So here we have uh, dark matter. Dark matter is uh, dark. Our dark matter is chi. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people in particle physics likes the chi's dark matter. Um, don't know why, but uh, I just followed the rule. Uh, the mediator is z prime, um, and that's, uh, yeah, the, the, this is quarks. This is quarks. Uh, this is leptons, quarks. Uh, lab quarks is the constituents of protons. This leptons, leptons uh, um, is the um, is you know uh, electron, muon, and uh, and tau leptons, uh, and then uh, these neutrinos. You don't have to really understand this, uh, but basically this is one of model that I want to show you that carries us to when we go to other uh, the, uh, other other ways to detect dark matter. Uh, but that here it looks scary, but it's really um, it's really um, something that uh, that shouldn't be scary. So it's basically if you have a dark matter, say it's dark matter, and you have an electron here, um, then the potential from this model, uh, the potential of this uh, v is just um, three. We have g here, so we have a we have g here this coupling G, so we need to specify. So uh, we need to specify the mass of dark matter, the mass of the mediator, because we have no idea what they are. So in this model, we have to specify, and we also have to specify how, how strong the, uh, the dark matter uh, and mediator couple, and how strong the quarks and dark matter couple, uh, couple. This G could be different, but I just set it to be uh, equal. So again, like if you have a dark matter sitting here, and you have uh, an electron sitting here, then the potential interaction between these two is given by 3g squared over 4 pi, uh, 1 over r, e to the minus m z prime over r. Um, you should compare it with you have a e plus e minus. E, e plus e minus, the potential, you know, the usual column potential in this unit. So I'm using heaviside Lorentz unit that particle physics usually use, e to the pi. So, uh, you know, it's kind of close. They, are, they look close together. It's just there is a this factor. Uh, that's e to the minus mz. So the interaction within this, the potential just drops down quickly as you go farther from the, uh, as r gets bigger. So um, this uh, type of interaction is just, uh, just tells you that, you know, uh, the interaction is local, unlike the, uh, short range, unlike the E plus E minus, the interaction is long range. This is just example of model. There are many models out there. So, um, but from this, if I know the Lagrangian, I know the interaction, I'll just plug it into uh, micromegas or my PM and I get what's the number of couplings to get the particle density. So this number of coupling that get, uh, in order to get correct like that density. So, uh, all right, relic density. So, uh, you know, depends on the mass of dark matter, of course. And here I said, uh, so they, we have to three degrees of freedom, right? Mz prime, M chi, and Mt. So I pick, I have to pick one because it's two dimensional plot. So I pick Mz prime to be 100 GB. So this one is exact. This one is not, uh, you know, like the, one, the one that we did before, like back to the calculation. If I you plug it into micromegas, you get the, uh, the correct, uh, you know, 
the, 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 the actual value. And G really depends. So as G is stronger, um, uh, as G is bigger, then the interaction has to be stronger. So in order to, to create heavy dark matter, you need a strong uh, interaction. But for this uh, value, um, it goes deep. So you don't need that strong of a coupling to get the uh, correct color density because this is basically around M uh, chi equal to 50 GeV or uh, Mz prime over two. This is called resonance. Basically, if you have resonance, the cross section just gets bigger for the same coupling and you don't need that big coupling to get the correct like density. Same thing here, this is for Mz um, 100 GeV and this is for Mz uh, 500 GeV. MZ prime 500 GeV, and then you see that the resonance happens at different places, happens at 250. So, uh, you know, it's it's not hard actually to do this calculation if you know how to use micromegas or MATM. So that's story about the WIMP miracle. Um, then I probably will have time to talk about, quickly about direct detection before uh, talking about the, um, the collider. Why do I want to talk about direct detection? Um, because um, because usually when people talk about collider, they connect it with direct detection. So I want to spend a little bit of time on direct detection. You'll get more lectures about that later. But uh, in order, I just need to tell you about this because um, you know it's it's to make the flow of this this uh, lecture to be uh, to be a little bit more smooth. Um, so the detection is simple. Uh, you have been told uh, yesterday. Uh, by Dr. Wandari. So the detection is just basically we have this plot, right? Interaction between the the the, uh, the dark matter and the star model. Um, if time goes to the direction, basically in the early universe, uh, yeah, dark matter can can create the star model. So now you just turn this diagram, and time goes to direction. You have dark matter hitting the star model particle becomes dark matter again, then no star model particle. That easy. So um, for this, um, so basically that detection is just, you can imagine that uh, you have uh, like an atom sitting here or nucleus sitting here. And so, uh, you know, at some point probably, uh, you know, the, uh, there is a dark matter come and hits the nucleus. And then what happens is the nucleus just get kicked. Like this, right? The nucleus just get kicked. And since we don't see a uh, dark matter, so if you see something that's just sitting here and not moving and suddenly it moves, we know there's, uh, but we don't see the thing that hit, hits the, uh, the nucleus, right? Uh, that means that it could be that the dark matter just hit the, uh, the nucleus. Um, very quickly, uh, we should check the, uh, if the dark matter actually probed the nucleus or the nucleon, the, uh, the proton neutron or the, uh, um, the, uh, the quarks itself. Let's calculate the wavelength of the dark matter. Um, the wavelength is, this usual HM over V. Um, now we talk about wind dark matter. So, uh, uh, so this is like 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34. I'll just do the SI unit. Uh, so 100 GeV is about uh, 1.8 times 10 to the, uh, so we, we take wind, so we take this is 100 GeV and I go back to SI unit, just for fun, uh, minus 25. Then the velocity is, you know, uh, 10 to the three, or 10 to the minus three of uh, speed of light, so 300 kilometer per second. So uh, yeah, let's put kilometer per second here. If you work it out, then minus 34, this is uh, 10 to the minus 25. And, and this is like 10 to the five meter per second. So 34, 25, five, you'll end up with something like, um, hopefully I do the math correctly, minus 14 meter. Right. I don't know if right. um, so 10 to the minus 14 meter. Um, the, the scale of uh, radius of a proton is proton radius. Uh, not, we don't have a sharp uh, proton radius, but it's kind of radius of proton is and neutron is specifically 10 to the minus 15, one into meter. So basically, uh, dark matter will not probe the proton. Definitely will not probe the quarks, but it will probe the whole nucleus. Uh, the whole nucleus by itself. Okay, very good. Um, let us do um, um, let us do a quick uh, tour on direct matter direct detection. 
um, um, let's 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 do simple calculation here just to get some idea on how uh, the dark matter uh, the reflection works. Um, so we have the dark matter here, chi, hitting a nucleon, a uh, nucleon here, just so it will probe the whole nucleus. Um, so we have the dark matter velocity, initial velocity of uh, V chi, and the nucleon, I forget, hits. Uh, the nucleon initially, uh, you know, it doesn't move. Uh, and then after it gets hit, the, the dark matter velocity is V chi prime, and the nucleon uh, velocity is V n prime. Then you would have something like, um, so you just use conservation of momentum, uh, m uh, chi, v chi plus m uh, n, oh sorry, the initial uh, m chi, v chi prime plus m n, v n prime, and the conservation of energy. Uh, simple equation, you can work it out. And uh, well, yeah, uh, I will, I'll not show you. This is basic physics, so I'll not teach you basic physics. Uh, but you'll get the, um, uh, you divide this and you'll get the uh, V chi equal to uh, V chi prime plus uh, V n prime. Um, and then you put this back into this uh, in the end you'll get uh, vn prime equal to i'll just put it uh, in the next slide vn prime equal to um 2 m chi v chi over um mn plus m um, if you divide the uh, radius mass uh so radius mass is m chi is all story uh, Um, sorry, um, I got I got blocked here by this uh, zoom thing. So I'll just put it slightly down here. Ah, I got m n over m n plus m chi. Then you would get something um, like v n is two mu uh, v chi over m n. So we have a relation between uh, the initial velocity of dark matter and then the final velocity of the, the recalled nucleus. Um, you just put this, uh, but we want to know the energy of uh, uh, recall energy of the nucleus. So it's like just one half m n v n squared. You just plug this into this and you end up with two mu um, m n, sorry, a mu squared m n squared v, uh, sorry, v chi squared. So actually, I here I'm assume that uh, you know everything moves in the one D direction. Uh, this is my assumption because I want to make things simple. But this is actually the maximum recoil energy. Um, if you work up uh, this in an angle, then uh, then um, you'll get um, you'll get uh, the the recoil energy to be uh, lower than this, right? So we have the maximum recoil energy. Good. Um, now. Um, now uh, let's see, uh, like you know, what's the typical recoil energy that we have? Um, we plug in the value of v chi, the dark matter velocity, to be like ten to the minus three c. Um, what's the typical value of n, the nucleon? Well, it depends on the target. Let me just pick uh, xenon as the target. Uh, uh, just, just it's a, it's a common. Usually, the target would be xenon. You'll get more. Uh, about this later, you have usually target is xenon or uh, germanium or silicon, even like more uh, complex uh, uh, crystal, like in crust, they use, what is it, uh, Ca, W, tungsten, uh, and oxygen. Um, so you, you, you have a lot of variety of, uh, of targets, but I'll just pick one, xenon, because, uh, you know, uh, because we have to pick one. The mass of xenon is 120 GeV, if you work out in GeV. Um, there, um, there you will see that the, um, 
the recoil energy depends on the mass of dark matter, of course. If the mass of dark matter, say, uh, MK is 100 GV, you plug it in here, um, the mu you can calculate. Uh, here you have MN, you have MK, you have this velocity. You get the recoil energy to be um, around um, 40 uh, MeV. Just plug it in. Mm, 40 MeV. If you remember, 40 MeV is um, is the uh, energy of approximately the energy of uh, you know nuclear decay. So, which is good? Is it bad? Uh, in one sense, you can think it's very good because we already we have the detector ready to detect the movement of nucleus. Um, so the detector is kind of ready. Uh, so we are in the correct. So we don't have to create uh, you know new exotic detectors to detect dark matter, um, but that is bad because we will get a lot of backgrounds coming from the nuclear uh, decays. Uh, another comment is if for MK equal to um, one uh, GV, for example, if I plug uh, MK equal to one GV, I'll get equal energy to be uh, 10 kV. So almost another, another mine, well, yeah, three orders of magnitude lower than the, um, than the, uh, than this equal energy. And uh, the lower, if you go for lower, if you try to detect particle with lower energy, usually there is more backgrounds to this. And you'll see in the, in the most of direct detection plot, uh, there is a minimum, num uh, you know, they, they have the threshold, meaning that there is a minimum uh, value of uh, the lightest value of the dark matter that they can prove. Have you, they cannot go lower than that. Um, what else? Um, if you have, uh, for example, if you have helium, yes, I don't think anybody uses helium, but I use helium just for uh, easiness, it's for GV, uh, with MK 100 GV. Uh, the recoil energy is around, um, work it out, 10 MeV. So, uh, so the recoil energy is lower. Um, so this means there is, uh, somewhat incentive to go for heavier target, but it's not always like that. But usually uh, if you see that um, most of their detection experiments, they try to look at heavier targets because the recoil energy is larger. Although it, that's not on the only consideration on this. Um, yeah, um, so that's, that's the recoil energy. You can imagine how big and how small it is. And it, it will give you some motivation on like where and how to look. Now look at, let's just quickly uh, looking at the rate of the, uh, the direct detection. Um, the rate, uh, well, you basically have a, like a detector here, like, uh, you know, like xenon, you have a bath of xenon, like uh, usually you use liquid xenon, why? Because you need it to be cold so that you make sure it doesn't move. Um, say, uh, and then you have uh, the wind of dark matter coming here, all right? Um, um, so um, we have a uh, xenon, say, say we have xenon, xenon, say we have one ton of xenon, it's quite a lot. Um, the density of xenon is actually um, uh, three uh, gram per centimeter cube, but just take one. We, we do, uh, you know, back to the back to the calculation here. So say one ton of xenon is about one meter cube, actually a third of that, but really. We want to do back to our population, so we are fine. We have a wimp, uh, wimp here, so let's 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 check how much uh, you know. What's the uh, how many infections do we have? The infection is easy. Um, well, not that, uh, well, it's just uh, you know that the, the formula that I show you before n interaction is sigma um, n chi, the number of dark matter, and uh, target and xenon divided by a the uh, um, this A, the A is this, this, uh, this, you know, the, 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 the area of the target here. Um, so, um, and xenon, and xenon is easy. We have one ton of xenon. If you remember your basic chemistry class and xenon, um, is equal to, you know, um, how just, um, you know, one ton is, uh, what is one ton in grams, one ton S 10 to the six grams. Right, yeah, 10 to the 6 gram um, will divided by the uh, molecular number of xenon and you multiply by the upper number. 
um, you work it out. Um, it's a lot actually. Uh, um, you'll get the numbers. Just you know, just look at the table, and then I'll just show you the numbers that I get is um, five times ten to the twenty-seven. It's a lot of uh, a lot of particles, right? And because the Avogadro number is um, is ten to the twenty-three, so uh, and so you, we have one ton of this enough. So there's a lot. Um, what about the uh, the Enkai, the dark matter? Um, the dark matter um, Enkai, it's uh, it's rho uh, chi uh, the uh, rho chi times the velocity. Do we know the rho of the chi? Well, we have to. So not the velocity. Sorry, rho uh, times the the volume. Right, it's just n rho times volume. Um, rho of dark matter, um, we have to rely on uh, simulations or um, you know just 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 the um, the curve actually the the, the curve uh, the rotation curve of the uh, of the Milky Way, and we know it's about um, zero point three. So rho is about um, zero point three uh, GeV in uh, divided by m chi in gv so uh, so m chi in gv per centimeter uh, cube so uh, we know that value so it's rho uh, whatever the number is uh, uh, multiplied by the velocity so the the, the this v is uh, you know just the length um, so it's just the length. So you have a cube here. You assume that there's a length multiplied by a. So the length is the velocity. So now this is the velocity this is the volume, and this is the velocity times the time. Okay. Um, so you have sigma. Ah, sigma. What is sigma? Sigma. We just take the usual our usual value g to the fourth m chi. Say m chi uh, is equal to 100, and then um, you know 10 to the minus 8. Uh, GeV uh, minus two, and then you multiply this uh, with the uh, so it's equal to um, um, uh, four times ten to the minus forty meters square. So this is the uh, what we assume for the sigma. Good. Uh, so you just you know you have the expression of Nkai, a lot of ten to the twenty-seven. So it sounds like a lot of events that coming out, but then it goes down by the sigma. Sigma is 10 to the minus 40. So, you know, little, you have rho. Rho is 0 0.3 by m chi. So 10, you know, 10 to the minus 3. A, this A will just, you, you cross this A with this. V is just the usual V. Um, so uh, 3 times 10 to the 5 meter per second. Um, so you get another factor of 5 here. T, well, T depends on how long uh, we want to take the how long you know we want to take the data so it takes one day okay for for me it's just one day is a it's a good number how much how many events that we get in one day one day is you know about in seconds it's nine ten to the four second you plug this in together um you you start to get a sense right big number however this small number but then you get traced by big number big number here in the end you get the interaction for one day uh, to be um, to be 10 to the minus 3 events per day. Ah, 10 to the minus 3 per day. Okay, that's not good. In 1,000 days, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, you, you, need, you need a year, about a year to get, uh, about to get one events. Okay, that, but that's, that, that actually <laughs> kind of be, brings some problem. Um, I don't know if you have seen Geiger counter, Remember, we talked about the background is uh, the uh, the background is the uh, the nuclear uh, effects, right? The the nuclear decays. Um, and I have gather counter here. I don't have anything radioactive near me, but you can hear the sound. Like not not in one day, not even one day. In one minute, I would have. Uh, a lot of counts, like probably like the background here, probably uh, about 10 counts per minute or something like that. And your signal is 10 to the minus 3 events per day. So 
well then you have to do a lot of things to uh, to make to, you know, to observe uh, the dark matter using that way but it's not possible it's it's basically Dr. Wonder spent her time working at press uh, uh, experiment press observation so then uh, uh, actually she can well she can tell you but you'll you'll hear uh, a lot of uh, about this in the later uh, later talks about how to reduce the background so then you can see um, the, uh, the 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 dark matter events without getting confused with this uh, this you know noise background around us. Um, so that tells you how hard it is on uh, looking for dark matter in the reflection. Um, that's a little bit um, common. I will not also, I will not go into details. Again, um, remember if you have a model. So now we start from model, and then we want to calculate the actual cross section. Uh, if you have a model, you usually have a model that the dark matter couples through a mediator to quarks, right? But we say that the uh, uh, here the dark matter actually couples since it has low velocity and the uh, uh, sorry uh, the the yeah low velocity and the um, um, the uh, the wavelength is larger than the uh, than the quarks for sure. It's order of nucleus, so we have to what we have to do in in our theory we have dark matter uh, quarks but in reality then we have to work in the effective field theory of nuclear physics to get the dark matter uh, coupled to nucleus uh, nucleons so to proton and neutrons and then the third step is uh, dark matter to nucleus so uh, there is a Tons of calculation going to this uh, direction, but from the structure of how dark matter coupled with quarks, um, this is nucleons, proton, or neutron. Um, you can divide this interaction into two. Um, it's called spin uh, dependent and spin independent. So spin dependent and spin dependent. It depends on you know the structure of the dark matter coupling to quarks. Um, I will not go too deep into this. Actually, um, there is another session for this. Um, but spin independent is uh, is spin dependent is when you require uh, the spin of nucleus to, to flip, the spin of uh, nucleus uh, nucleus to flip or nucleon. If a nucleon, you can see it from nuclear level to flip. Spin independent, you don't require that the spin to flip. Uh, also, this might, might, but uh, it requires a lot of work. This might tell you the properties of dark matter since you start to probe the, uh, the dark matter, uh, the quantum uh, properties of dark matter. This might, but if, you, if they discover this way, they will not tell you the spin of the dark matter right away. It requires a little bit more work on that. Um, so, spin independent, since uh, it usually, usually has stronger constraint. Why? Because um, because you know you basically uh, you basically probe the whole uh, quarks, the whole nucleons inside your nucleus. So basically, see everything, and then you get some something called enhancement. But for spin dependent, um, because inside nucleus one and you know the spin of uh, protons and neutron might go in the other directions. Um, you know it can go to any direction it wants. So the bounce is usually much much. Uh, Lower or orders of magnitude lower than spin independent one. Okay, um, I think um, yeah, I I think uh, Dr. Wolander already uh, showed you a version of this plot uh, yesterday. Um, but this is the uh, the bound on the spin independent. We don't see we haven't seen dark matter. Okay, well, I, I, you know, except Dama people, they claim they see the dark matter. But as far as we know that we haven't seen any hint of the dark matter. So we don't see that uh, a nucleus uh, suddenly moves away. Or we have seen that, but we know it's not from dark matter. Uh, uh, at least we are not 100% sure. It's, it's about statistics, actually. But, so we haven't conclu conclusively see there is, a, there, is a, there is a dark matter. So all we say that we, uh, we can put some bounds. This is the bound on the... Uh, dark matter mass with mass and then how it interacts so it's basically the cross section the cross section and everything above this line is excluded how do i know um, because 
everything above this line. So if I pick the dark matter 100 GeV, um, then above this line, it would have bigger cross section, right? Bigger cross section mean, mean more events. More events meaning that I should already see that, but I don't see it. So anything above this line is excluded. This solid line is excluded. Um, so that's the bound from the xenon. Uh, they have one ton and they take the data for about one year. So that's how how how, how crazy they are. <laughs> it's taking a long time. And so with the same amount of data, this is the uh, the bound from this pin dependent cross section. And I still told you this is like look at the bottom here is like 10 to the 46, and the bottom here is like 10 to the minus 40. So the spin dependent uh, bound is much weaker than spin independent bound. And usually when we talk about collider, we're gonna compare it with this plot. So that's why I want to spend some time on this uh, direct detection. Now, uh, that's one way to detect dark matter. The other way is actually speed, uh, sorry, uh, indirect detection, but you have a lecture on that uh, later. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, we have to compare, I want to compare this uh, U1, uh, the, our, our model, U, U1 B minus L, uh, B minus 3 L uh, into, um, into our, uh, uh, you know, compared with the, uh, the xenon bound. So this line, the blue lines is the prediction for our model. How do we get prediction? We, you know, we uh, basically, we, I use micro omegas. But, but the, uh, that's the quick answer. The longer answer is like, you know, I know what's the G value for the relic density, and then I can calculate the cross section of dark matter nuclear interaction, basically, um, basically coming from this, you know, uh, closer to this E to the fourth divided by M chi squared, but kind of close to that, but not exactly because I have to really break the assumption that M, the mediator and the dark matter mass are the same. So, um, here, this is my prediction. Look, look my prediction, uh, this is Sinon, Sinon, uh, that Sinon, Sinon bounds. Look, my prediction has been excluded by Sinon almost all the way, except this. So this brings up two points. First point, this is why um, you hear that the dark matter, the wind dark matter, why, why people are excited about wind dark matter. We almost, at least in this model, we have excluded the wind dark matter. Isn't that crazy? We have crossed out one list. Of course, I pick one particular model. If you go to any other model, it might you might still fine. You might still be fine. But this one for this one particular model, it has been excluded, at least up to this point. Ah, what about this point? This point is the one that I told you, right? Because uh, for light dark matter mass, um, uh, there's so not the resolution, but the there is a threshold. You cannot go much lower uh, at this point. So the experiment just say it stops here, but there are some other experiments that tries to go lower. For example, uh, later uh, you'll be told that the uh, crass experiment is going to try to go this low, seen on itself to try to be, go this low. So this is another frontier that we want to go, low dark matter mass. Can we probe the wind dark matter at the low dark matter mass? And I believe you'll be told in the, the, uh, the next lectures. So that's it for the uh, for the spin dependent. Now move on to collider. Um, this is actually my expertise. Um, I've written some uh, papers on dark matter to colliders, uh, dark matter uh, production uh, in colliders. Um, but let's see, what do we need for the dark matter uh, to collider? Basically, it's just this plot again and just put it around. So you have. Two dark matter, uh, sorry, two star motor particles, uh, basically at the LSC is two proton and it create uh, the dark matter. That's it. So basically the same wind paradigm, the same diagram, uh, you just turn it around and you get various uh, way. Uh, so basically that's, this is what uh, Dr. Wolander told you yesterday. Uh, I, I remember there's one slide uh, that, that explained this. Okay, let's go to, um, a little bit detail on this. Um, the one collider that is running and the most powerful right now is uh, is called Large Hadron Collider. Um, it's big. Uh, it, this circumference is 27 kilometers. Imagine you're running 27 kilometers. Quite um, well, yeah, it's quite tiring. But it's not above the the ground. It's 100 meter below the ground. 
Uh, why? Because we want to um, basically eliminate all the uh, nuclear backgrounds. Uh, that's the thing also being done in the direct experiments, mainly the cosmic ray backgrounds. It's located in the uh, between the uh, the France and and uh, um, France and uh, Swiss Switzerland um, uh, uh, border. Um, this is the city of Geneva. Um, yeah, it, now it, the the large Hadron Collider actually has is a ring, and then this ring has a, a two protons going around. So um, it has one proton going in this direction. Uh, the color is not good, right? Maybe yellow is better. Um, one direction and the other proton going in the other direction. So it's actually not one ring but two rings. Uh, otherwise, you will not collide. Uh, protons, right? It's a proton-proton collider. So one direction and the other direction. Um, okay. Um, so then, at some point, so so those two have a two beam pipe, right? It goes on one direction, the other direction, and the the two beam pipe, uh, two pipe will meet at four interaction points. One is CMS, the other is LHCb, um, Atlas, and Alice. Um, these four. Uh, for uh, interaction points, they have detectors actually to detect the product of the collision. Um, um, the one that interests to us is Atlas and CMS actually. They are uh, general purpose detectors. LSCB is very specific, it's looking for uh, B hadrons, um, but they can also probe dark matter uh, in some models. Um, Alice is looking for the uh, quark one plasma. So they have four interactions here. Um, so here's what I told you. For it has uh, two rings, one go, uh, one proton going in into uh, you know clockwise direction in one um, in one direction, and then uh, yeah clockwise direction, and the other beam goes to uh, uh, yeah the one is counterclockwise and the other clockwise. At some point at, at you know CMS or Atlas or LSCB or LS, they meet in the in the middle. Um, so usually uh, the way uh, accelerator works, you cannot really have a continuous stream of uh, protons, but basically, what you do um, because of you do it in using uh, you know uh, radio waves, um, you have to have a bunch. We call it bunch. This bunch is just a beam of uh, of protons from inside each uh, inside each ring. So there is a bunch here, empty bunch, empty bunch. Each bunch consists of uh, ten to the uh, eleven protons. And bunch empty, bunch empty. So they, you know, you have a bunch of protons uh, going around. Okay, good. So you have uh, basically, uh, you know, you have uh, this bunch of protons, 10 to the 11 protons here. Let's throw it this way. And you have another bunch of protons, 10 to the 11 protons this way. And boom, they interact at this interaction point. And then you have to detect. There is, so there is a detector here. Good. Um, now, um, again, like we have to estimate, right? How much the interaction uh, happening? Um, again, like we just used uh, our simple uh, calculation, uh, the fourth and then uh, say uh, 100 squared. So uh, it's, it would be like in meters squared, 10 to the minus 40 meters squared, good. Um, so the number of interaction is N, N1, N2 divided by A, right? Um, so M sigma is 10 to the minus 40, and one is how many? Uh, 10 to the 11, uh, 10 to the 11, and sorry, um, 10 to the 11, and then the uh, the size is quite small. The size is actually uh, one micron. The size of this this uh, this thing, this bunch is a uh, minus it squared. So minus 40, 11, 11, 6, this you get 12 here, uh, but you have minus 40 here, so you get 10 to the minus 6. So in one bunch collision, the interaction is 10 to the minus 6. Um, so uh, so that sounds like there's no hope detecting dark matter inside the inside collider, you get 10 to the minus 6 even, even in this good scenario. Uh, but, but please remember that this bunch, uh, actually there are a lot of bunches running around. So the way they collect data is they have um, um, 40 megahertz bunch collision. 
So in one second, the, you expect to have a 40 dark matter creation. If you know if this if this picture is correct, if the dark matter is wind or 40 dark matter. Yeah, so uh, it's it's okay, it's all right. Then and LST has been running for years basically, so you get a lot of dark matter events. If again, like if this is correct. Um, so, but there is a problem, a little problem with this. So imagine if, so there is 10 to the 11 particle here, 10 to the 11 particle here. You, you expect to say one, one, one would, would, would annihilate and create dark matter. So one, in, one proton inside this would annihilate. They, they smash each other and becomes the dark matter. And you cannot detect dark matter. So basically what, what will you see? You have 10 to the 11 proton coming one direction, 10 to the 11 proton and coming in direction, and you lose one or a pair. <laughs> you cannot really calculate 10 to the 11 uh, minus one, right? Because really you have to go one by one and then you find, well, is there anything missing? Uh, it's, it's very hard to do. So usually what we do is uh, we do a little bit trick, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is we, are, we are going to have uh, something recoil against the, uh, the dark matter. But before I go to that direction, let's think uh, about what we see if we, uh, if we, uh, if we collide two protons together. What we see, we have a menu on the table. We, this is uh, standard world particles. So all of this here is standard world particles from the uh, neutrinos, leptons, uh, quarks, uh, W, Higgs, and Z. So anything that we created will end up either on the standard world particle or in this dark sector particle. So they only have two options. Okay, sorry. They only have two options, uh, either standard particle or um, standard particle or dark sector particle. Dark sector particle will not be detected, uh, but even standard particles, we have to think a little bit, which one is can be detected? Most of the standard particle, for example, the Higgs, the Higgs would decay right away. Um, so the Higgs decays right away to, for example, a BB bar or tau tau bar. And will not, tau, sorry, tau plus tau minus. So it will not be detected. W, it decays quickly, for example, to electrons to the neutrino, um, then it will not be detected as well. Uh, well, W is not detected, but the product can be detected. So which one can be detected? The question is, what, what is stable? Um, electron is stable, right? It will not decay anymore. So we'll detect electrons. Um, what is stable? Is tau stable? So W is not stable. X is not stable. We'll not see X and W directly. Z is not stable. Is photon stable? Yes, photon is stable. Right. Yeah, photon doesn't decay. Mu is a little bit tricky. It's not stable, but the decay length is very long. So we'll see mu muon uh, before it decays. Uh, tau is not stable in polar scale, so we'll not see tau. Um, and then we have neutrinos here. Neutrino is stable, but it interacts really weakly, right? You have uh, one neutrino. Uh, Neutrino is like, uh, it's really, really hard to detect. Like, you know, sometimes you, it interacts like after one uh, light years of lab, for example. So uh, it's really uh, very hard to detect. Um, uh, so how, um, so how do we detect neutrino? Ah, we can be smart. Um, so for example, in this case, if two protons collide and create W, W decays into electrons, right? So electrons and neutrino, but the the momentum of the p, uh, you know, the momentum the, in the center of mass uh, uh, in the center of mass uh, frame, the momentum of the two protons, the initial momentum is zero, right? Because one are going to one direction and the other goes in direction with the same speed. So if the e the product the decay product of w has to, uh, you know, has to be back to back. So it has to, one goes to one direction and the other is going to the other direction. Ah, so what you see at the collider, you'll see the E going to this direction and you will not see the neutrino, but you see something going in this, dire this direction. You see E going to this direction. So if you see something flying in one direction, you know from the conservation of momentum that there has to be something uh, against uh, this E. So we know that neutrino has been produced. So that's how you detect neutrino. Um, gluon and quarks is a little bit spatial because um, there is something called um, um, a quark confinement.
in quark confinement, you will never able to be able to produce quarks alone. So if you have a, if you have something that decays into quark, for example, this B, uh, let's just say U U bar, U uh, U bar, then uh, or you you separate to a quark, right? You have U, you have U here, U bar here, and then suddenly because the the, it's, the interaction is very very strong, then suddenly out of the vacuum you create um, not suddenly, but yeah, out of vacuum you create another quarks, another quark pair out of the vacuum. So you have D bar here, for example, and you have be here and it will become another uh, another uh, hadron so basically if you have a you, you can create quark alone but you see what you see is a bunch of hadrons so if you ever to create quark at the uh, the the LSC what you see is the, uh, the 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 you know the this product of confinement mostly is the particle called pi on pi plus or phi zero or uh, kion uh, or could be a proton as well. So what you'll see is this. Uh, so um, and they actually goes into one direction at the same direction as the uh, original quarks, um, and we call this jets. It's different from ast astrophysical jets, but it's what we call this is jets. Um, so um, uh, gluon also the same. Quark and gluon they they cannot they 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 will become something a uh, bunch of hadrons. Uh, uh, we call it jets. Okay, so now this is the, so the idea is the one that we can detect is uh, muon, electron, photons, um, jets, um, jets coming from the quarks and uh, and neutrino coming from the uh, neutrino. We cannot really detect it directly, but we see it from the you know something recoil against. Uh, Against uh, against the something else, the electron, for example. And if you look at the the uh, structure of the, uh, the the collider detector, for example, here CMS, it will, it's one is huge. Look at the person here. Second, it looks like a cylinder, and the interaction point actually happens like in the middle. So we take the lateral cross section of that. Um, we'll see a bunch of uh, detectors here, and each detector has their own purpose. The inside. Uh, is silicon tracker basically it tells you if there is a um, charge particle moving around if there is no charge particle it will not leave any track but if there is charge particle for example like electrons then it will it will leave a track actually electron muons and bunch of uh, hadrons uh, the second one is electronic detector its purpose is to uh, measure photons and electrons uh, or positrons same thing so they for, uh, uh, photons electron will deposit their energy here and then you'll know their energy from this uh, from this electromagnetic colorometer um, the difference between photon and electrons photon is neutral so it will not leave any tracks in the uh, so these photons because this not leave, this doesn't leave any tracks at the silicon trackers but electrons or positron will leave some, some tracks um, hydraulic kilometers is to measure you know those jets so it can detect phi zero, phi plus minus uh, um, k pro, uh, proton will leave deposit their energy around here. And outside we have uh, something called muon chambers that will measure the muon. So that's what we can detect um, at the LSC. So we cannot detect everything. Ah, dark matter. Back to the question of dark matter. How can we detect dark matter? Huh? Um, we have, I haven't mentioned about dark matter. Ah, same thing. So um, again, we cannot detect dark matter by see how much uh, we cannot. We, yeah, we cannot detect dark matter by counting how many protons coming in and how many protons coming out. But what we can see from dark matter is um, we have a protons and protons. They annihilate and become dark matter. Usually, dark matter pair is most theory. But protons, since they are strongly interacting, they can emit gluon, and gluon uh, becomes jets. And gluon will go to one direction, and then we have we see nothing here. This is an example um, of um, probable dark matter detection. Turns out to be not, uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, but this is an example of probable dark matter detection. So you basically have bunch of jets going to one direction, but you know the momentum is not a is not is 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 converse. So there is no momentum in 
uh, you have con conservation of momentum in this in this uh, y x you know x and y axis. Um, since the original momentum is zero, so you have to have something recoil against this, which is could be the dark matter, right? So you have just one jet going direction. It doesn't have to be a gluon. It could be photon as well. So this is called a monojet event. But if you have uh, instead of gluon, it could be since photon has uh, proton has charge, it could uh, you know have photons and will deposit their energy in the uh, electron accelerometer. It's called monophoton uh, event. So, but usually at the LSE monojet, you see a strong as well. So that's uh, what happens. Um, but if you notice. Uh, um, same process could happen. How do we know it's dark matter neutrino? We don't know because proton and proton, when they collide, they can produce Z boson and Z boson can produce neutrino as well. And then you could have a gluon coming out from this. So, um, so you cannot really distinguish this event, uh, this monojet event uh, from the that creates dark matter compared with the one that creates uh, neutrinos. You cannot, then, and you just have to live with that. Uh, but that's basically your background. Um, so then what we can do is we try our best to predict this process because this process, uh, creation of neutrino through Z, is, uh, is very well known process. We have, we, you know, because Z can also decay into, for example, an electron pair. So we can just take the Z into electron pair and then we compare that with neutrinos. You know, we have some good good theory on how to uh, switch from the electrons to neutrino on the cross section, or how many number of events, and then we see if, say, if we predict so, say, if we predict uh, 100 events, but we see 100 monojet events from this uh, neutrino creation, but then we see 150 events total in monojet. Ah, we have seen dark matter. Um, so um, that's what the uh, they do. Um, this is what they do. Um, actually, the the um, uh, if you go into details of experiments, then it's always not as nice as the story because uh, it turns out that there is a Z plus uh, totally like the uh, the jets plus neutrinos, but it turns out that W creation to leptons plus neutrino can also mimic this signal, a monojet signal. Basically, the one lepton, you don't have 100% efficiency. So there's some one lepton, you can miss one lepton and you'll see something like uh, like uh, like monojet as well. You could, you could even miss two leptons all the way. Um, but okay, in any case, these are the prediction. So these top lines are the prediction and this dot line is the data. Do you see an extra? No, you don't see an extra. You have the prediction of the uh, the the monojet from the stunnable processes, the Z to jets. You make a prediction like this, and you see events like this. You see prediction like this. You see event like this. You see uh, you know uh, prediction like this. You see events exactly the same, which kind of amazing because your prediction matches the, uh, the 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 what you see, but then it's kind of sad because you don't see anything. Um, so basically, we don't see any dark matter production at the collider till now, just as we haven't seen any dark matter at the direct detection experiments. Um, okay, so um, I think I wrongly put this, uh, yeah, this, this thing. Um, Atlas has its own benchmark, um, same thing. Um, so, so then we don't see anything, um, then we have to, um, we have to work out, um, you know, what's the bound on the, on this from this, we, since we don't see anything like what's the bound on some models, so Atlas picks a model that kind of close to us, but not exactly the uh, same. So they, they don't care about the Z dark matter coupling to uh, leptons because it's a it's a proton proton collider and there is only quarks inside proton. Um, so they have Z, they have Z prime and the, they have ZF, and then they have Q like this. The coupling, they put the coupling of dark matter and the uh, um, the quarks to be different later. So now we have four degrees of freedom, which is mz, uh, m chi, and the matter, and g chi, and g q. So these are their they are the benchmark. Um, so they uh, they can put it in uh, you know in some 
a nice uh, plot. Uh, so we have the four degrees of freedom again, right? We have all four parameters, M chi and M Z P. That's what they choose to plot, and they have to choose the other two. So they choose G Q to, you know, a quarter and G chi to be one. Um, and then they have this plot. Anything inside this uh, has been excluded. Um, yeah, uh, because light dark matter. So remember, again, like this, Q to the fourth M. Uh, so now I put M chi squared M. Uh, sorry, this M. Uh, so uh, and the fourth, the uh, the lighter um, mass we put the 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 bigger cross section we have. So this one is, is you know you expect to see some events around this area. So this has been excluded, and you can calculate relative density in their model, and you see that for the MZ prime, if you believe in relative density calculation, uh, thermal basically thermal production of dark matter. Um, then you know you have to exclude this mass of Z prime and the mass of dark matter up to this point. Um, if you go a little bit um, deeper, um, basically what you have is the coupling of Z to quarks, right? Z V to the quarks. And you have coupling of Z V to the dark matter. So what you see in the collider, you have the quarks coming in inside the proton and you have Z, and then you produce the dark matter, right? And then you have something recoil against that. Time goes in direction. You have two quarks and you produce dark matter and you create a jet, basically. It's usually gluons. Um, but you can also do QQ, since the, the diagram is the same. CV goes to QQ as well. Now, this is uh, easier to see because basically you have uh, two jets. So instead of uh, uh, this one jet, you have jets in the other direction. And uh, the background in this, especially if the Q is B jet, uh, is it's much, much lower than the, the background uh, for monojet. So you get a stronger, stronger bound in this, in, this, uh, in this model. So at the collider, you have to think about what exactly the model that you have, you know, that you use um, in the, Direct detection usually you cannot produce the, something like this. You cannot produce CV. Uh, uh, really, you cannot really produce it. So um, usually it's a little bit less sensitive on the model for uh, direct detection. But for collider, since you have so much energy, you are very sensitive to the model. And this is um, uh, the, the bound. Now, now this is the same uh, atlas experiment, but they, you know, you can always uh, change the way you you do the background, uh, the, the, the plot. Um, so they, before we, we put MZP and M chi, but now what they do is they pick the G to be the same, but then they put M chi, but now in the Y axis, they put it an SI. As a, so you can basically map this the cro as a spin independent cross section to the uh, mass of the Z prime. And that's how they do it. Um, because they want to compare direct detection. This is direct detection uh, bounds compared with the, um, uh, with the collider bounds. Um, as you see, this is the bound from the missing energy, uh, basically monojet, right? Um, wow, the color is that. Uh, yeah, this is the bound, right? And this is the bound from the jet. And as I, as I mentioned, the bound from the jet basically is much stronger than the bound. Uh, from the uh, from the uh, from just monojet, but depends it really depends on the model. So they pick this model, um, and the bound from the uh, in this particular model, the bound from the direct detection is much is better than the the bound from the uh, the LFC, except for low mass. Again, there is low mass uh, that the LFC does a better job than the uh, the collider. This for spin independent. For the spin dependent, I don't have the plot, but I can tell you the story that for spin dependent, the the, the LIC bound is stronger than the uh, uh, the dark uh, the, the the direct detection bound. But everything depends on the model and your particle physics model. If you pick different model, the bound might be different. Um, just just quick uh, quick story about uh, our again you uh, you want my you want B minus three L. Um, it's the same story uh, because we could have a ZV close to QQ as well. Um, so um, 
so then we can put some bounds on how strong uh, our um, you know uh, on the ZV from the digest uh, process again um, and then in our case um, we have MG prime to be 100 and we not we see the coupling here on GQ is 0 0.15 so basically we can tell that uh, we have excluded this region from the collider why do I don't pick this direction because in this direction the the Z prime will decay mostly into um, dark matter instead of to the, the, the jet. So I have to be careful. So I just exclude this direction here. So yeah, um, the LHC has a strong, uh, uh, you know, can put some uh, can put some strong bounds in some models. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, in order to compare different direct detection with the collider, collider against indirect detection, direct detection against indirect detection, you have to really careful there because there is more consideration to be made. Um, yeah, I think it's a, almost a good time to end, um, but um, I will not talk about indirect detection. I prepare a lot actually, um, but you, you listen to that a lot. But um, I'm going to tell you a little bit, um, since the dark matter, um, the dark matter actually, you know, we only take, take handle the WIM. WIM is, you know, two or three orders magnitude out of that 10 to the 89 uh, possible dark matter mass out there, right? Um, so you can always be creative in discovering dark matter. You make an assumption and you, um, you, um, you make an assumption and you think on how to uh, discover dark matter using that assumption. So I'll not go into this, but, uh, but there, there are a lot of creative ways uh, out there to, to look at for dark matter. For example, in this, uh, there is a paper on, uh, so there is a paper on how to look for the black hole. The usual way is to look for the gravity lensing, but uh, since most of you uh, are uh, astronomy students, um, um, there is uh, one thing uh, called supernova type 1a. Some of you know, it's a kind of runaway uh, fusion. Um, so some people, uh, these guys, uh, Graham et al, um, they point out that if you have neutron star is sitting there nicely and suddenly a primal black hole uh, pass in, then uh, it might trigger supernova. Um, then you, you know, then then they can they can look at supernova out there. They can put some bounds on dark matter. Uh, uh, another one, if you have a very light dark matter, uh, it might affect, slow down, or speed out uh, planets on our solar system. So this guy point out, uh, you know, it could some, put some bone on the, uh, uh, the dark matter cross-section. Uh, this is the very light dark matter. Look at this EV and to the minus seven, 10 to the minus 32, basically 20, 10 to the minus 22 is the lower bound, right? Um, you, could, you could also do that. So from just from your planetary movements, um, with different set assumption, you can also put some bonds on dark matter mass. Um, so um, so basically, you this is even crazier. The light and dark matter in some model, um, you could have the mass and the charge of the electron changes uh, as a function of time, and then you could look at this is uh, a way to another way actually to look at the uh, it's basically uh, yeah another way to uh, look at the gravitational wave actually um, not using LIGO but using uh, task mass and then the distance between task mass to the laser might change. Um, but you can also, uh, since you know there is a huge ball here, then if there is the electron size, electron mass, uh, not the electron size, but the electron mass uh, changes. So the size of an atom might change, and you'll see the effect of this. The size of this ball, like you know, oscillates, and then, um, and then, um, then you can put some bonds on some other models of dark matter that way. So um, uh, other, there are so many other ideas, but in order to look for dark matter, since there are so many, uh, so many parameters space to explore. Um, so now we are coming close to exclude the wind dark matter. We are, we are quite close. Uh, as I showed you before, like even one of my model has been excluded by direct detection and, um, and collider. Uh, but it's not the end of the dark matter search. You can still, there's still many other uh, landscape of parameter space to go. So in order to do that, you have to think left, think right, think low, think high, oh, you can think up um, if only you try. So they are, So these are the avenue of dark matter uh, ideas this day. You have to think 
what's the assumption? Pick dark matter, pick one of dark matter uh, assumption, high mass, low mass, and then think about how they interact with the, uh, with our, with, with, you know, with Sarah model. And then you can try to propose how to search for dark matter. And uh, yeah, I'll end my, my, uh, uh, my lecture right now, and we have uh, probably we have some time for questions. Okay, very, uh, very nice, very informative uh, lectures we have today. And now let's move to questions. We have a couple of questions here. Um, okay, let me start with. Uh, Fernanda Putra Pratama. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, actually, my question is more related to the first session. Um, um, I still don't understand how to calculate the cross section for the for dark matter uh, because I noticed that uh, we need. Uh, degeneracy factor to uh -huh. calculate the cross section. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask what is the degeneracy factor of dark matter dependent on since we do not know any quantity like spin or maybe polarization mm -hmm. of DM. Um, uh, and since we do not know the, the spin of the dark matter, uh, which distribution uh, either Fermi Dirac uh, distribution or both Einstein distribution do we need to use to calculate the density of uh, dark matter? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, very good. Um, usually, um, so um, Usually, at least in the WIM calculation, the um, the velocity of dark matter during freeze out is uh, quite low, uh, low enough. So you actually don't have to really care about uh, Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein. It's Maxwell distribution. It's basically um, yeah, you uh, yeah, it's 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 you don't have to really care about that. But there is still a factor called the S here. Uh, you know, um, so in the end, you don't have to really care about that. Um, uh, about this um, uh, for the uh, because because um, for the uh, non-relative physics particles, so in a, usually uh, at least in the WIMP scenario, uh, the the dark matter has been non-relativistic during the freeze out. So basically, this factor will be much bigger than one. So it doesn't matter, right? Plus or minus if this factor is much bigger than one, right? Um, the one that you have to take care of is the GS. Um, uh, people are people tend to be biased because they work in supersymmetry, so they think about neutralino, which is spin one half. So people usually put uh, GS equal to two here. But if you have a specific model in mind uh, and you work on this uh, this that, that specific model. Um, and if you use Micromegas or MathDM to calculate that, um, they will take care of it for you automatically. But yeah, you have to put it in. But uh, but, but but yeah, you, you you have to put it in. But you don't have to be uh, yeah. If you if you put it in, if you use the tools, they will take care for you. So really, it depends on your assumption. It depends on your model. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. No oh, sorry. Okay, actually we still have one uh, question left from the first session. I will uh, ask oh, yeah. now, um, let's see. Arif Nurrahman, are you here? Arif Nurrahman, no? Okay, now let's uh, move to Bhuvaneswari Kashi. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. That was uh, really great, great lecture. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, 
my first question is uh, are there any negative masses ever discovered we have a theory regarding the dark matter masses negative masses uh, i've read a paper so what is your perspective on negative masses okay thank you for the question um i don't think there is a negative mass has been discovered so far um and i'm not aware about the uh, the dark matter uh, theory of dark matter as a negative masses so I really have to dig in into your question. I um, um, can you explain it? Oh, maybe yeah, just one or two sentences. Like, what is what is the uh, uh, what is the theory of dark matter as a negative masses? Like, I like like yeah, uh, maybe I can comment a little bit more. Uh, yeah, that. I've just uh, read the abstract and I was shocked. And they have considered negative masses because, uh, like, to uh, uh, calculate the uh, total entropy, like the total uh, total universe to be uh, neutral we have the positivity and we don't have anything negative so they have made it too neutral so and to calculate the entropy they have took negative mass uh, for the dark matter so there is uh, yeah I, I i'm not sure um, because um, if you learn quantum field theory if you have negative mass um, at least in your own engine, if you're negative mass, then um, you don't have ground state. But I, I probably mostly, most likely that I just misunderstood uh, your model. Um, but but yeah, if you want to uh, discuss uh, about this later, um, we can we can talk about this after. You know, you can send me the uh, the paper, and I can I can probably I can uh, understand the, the idea a little bit better because I'm biased uh, as a particle theorist who learned quantum field theory. If I had uh, if I put negative in my Lagrangian, then it will, it's not even separate, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, it doesn't have vacuum. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I might, I, I, yeah, we can, we can chat uh, sometime uh, later after this, if you, if you want, uh, you know. Yeah, sir, sure. Uh, uh, and uh, my second question is, uh, can mm -hmm. we create a Higgs field? Ah, can we create Higgs field? Yes, we can create Higgs field at the LHC. We have created Higgs field at the LSE, and we have discovered the Higgs field at the LSE. Um, yeah, and what's the like? Can you briefly explain uh, uh, about? So um, I don't have the uh, yeah, and just need, uh, the Higgs field is um, how you create Higgs field is um, um, it's uh, you collide to uh, two protons. Let me just uh, and then. Um, you create two pro you, you collide two protons and then uh, do two protons. So there is a theory um, that the that the Higgs coupled through the loop through gluons, right? Um, so basically, um, here. Um, so the, the theory is the um, this is two top quarks loop and then two gluons. And then it's also to uh, not only top quarks but W uh, and 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 top quarks two photons. So this is how the Higgs discovered inside a proton there is a quarks of course UUD if you know it, but there is also gluon because uh, the one that that um, that, that glue the that glue the protons together is gluon. Force so fields. The, yeah, the force fields basically. Um, so the gluons inside the proton they they interact and. Uh, they make the Higgs, and then this Higgs is would decay. They decay into, into gluon as well, but it's really hard to detect at the LHC. The cleaner one is to 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 uh, to photons. So you see two photons going back to back, uh, not yeah, not back to back in the uh, in the transverse plane, um, and then uh, you can actually measure the uh, the momentum of each uh, each photons, right? And yes. you can calculate the mass. Actually, it's just as simple as you know, uh, the mass should be uh, squared is just p1 plus p2 squared, right? The momentum of the four momentum of the first and second uh, photons. You have a lot of backgrounds here, but then um, since the Higgs only has one mass, and they see some excesses above the background at around 125 GeV. That's 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 what happens. 
So, That's interesting. Yeah, but now they they they're not only looking for the Higgs to uh, photons. They have they they are able to see Higgs to bottom quarks, top quarks. Uh, that not top. The Higgs does indicate uh, tau uh, to Z's. So there there are so many channels uh, in this possible decays on the Higgs decay, and they have observed most of them. So we sure that we have seen Higgs by now. Thank you, so that answers my question and okay. I'm looking forward to uh, interact with you about the negative masses. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Maybe, um, ah, I think uh, we miss uh, the host, we miss Dr. Ulandari. Um, I can take uh, another question, maybe from Hermawan Raditio. Uh, please, if you are still around. Hello. Okay, maybe. Um, Next one, um, uh, from Thomas Nabil. Uh, yes, Dr. Yes, okay. Yeah, uh, please. First, thank you for the great lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, if somehow uh, the WIMP paradigm uh, proved to be a, a very a dead end for uh, discovering dark matter, what could be the next promising candidate for, uh, for our search? Um, Theory-wise, <laughs> no promise. Well, nothing is more better than the others, but experimental-wise, right now people are really looking for axion or axion-like dark matter. So if the WIMP, we don't discover any WIMP. Uh, the one that's right now actively being searched is axion dark matter, very light dark matter, order of a, you know, ten, order of EV dark matter or even less than EV dark matter. That's the next uh, candidate that might be discovered, might, but we don't know the truth of, you know, we don't know if it's true, the truth of dark matter until we discover it. So if you don't see dark matter in that direction, probably, probably, just probably you'll see it, uh, um, you'll, you know, you probably you'll see it with the axion dark matter. Um, why axion dark matter is like, again, with dark matter is a bias, right? Because we have supersymmetry. Um, axion dark matter is also bias. We have, uh, uh, you know, um, the UCD theta problem. Uh, so there is some theory motivation from that. So anything that has theory motivation is you always bias and you already have a lot of experiments out there. But dark matter doesn't care about your theory bias, right? Um, so there is still a lot of avenue to look for dark matter. Okay, thank you, doctor. Okay, thank you. Um, next, uh, Jauza Akbar, Krito. Hello, uh, I want to ask about trivia question, maybe. Uh, is there, I have heard about the primordial black hole is formed by dark matter. So I don't know if it was correct or wrong. So uh, what will be this black hole special characteristic since we don't know or we ever detect any dark matter? Or then how we can be hypothesis about primordial this primordial black hole if we ever detect dark matter. Thank you. Ah, so, uh, okay, thank you for the question. Uh, the um, the um, dark matter might be primordial black hole. So dark matter is uh, like, you know, big term that's basically saying that we don't know. Um, that we don't know is one of possible things that we don't know is a uh, primal black hole. So uh, it's not that primal black hole is formed from the dark matter. It's like we don't know consists of what we don't know, but primal black hole is one of the candidates of dark matter. Um, so yeah, dark matter could be primal black holes um, and we are searching for it. Um, again, like the most, uh, the, 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 usually the, 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 the usual people, the usual things that people you, you know, used to search for primordial black hole is the uh, microlensing. Um, I, I believe you have learned about the gravitational uh, lensing before, but you know, you can try to be more creative because lensing, you know, they can probe only one part of the, uh, 
of the parameter mass, uh, you can try to go for the other masses by, you know, try to, uh, like the one that I mentioned earlier, the uh, the the detonation of a, a, a white dwarf, that's quite exciting, but um, there are other ideas, like for example, the primal vehicles would circle each other and that would might create a gravity wave. Um, what else? Um, yeah, there, 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 there are many things out there that I, I that, that I might not, maybe not even written in paper. So you can just assume there is a primal vehicle and think about the creative ways to discover it. Um, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Next is uh, from Eti Kurniati. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. I want to ask you about uh, the correlation between WIM and Big Bang nuclear synthesis. Can you explain the correlation between WIM and Big Bang nuclear synthesis? Thank you. Um, correlation between WIM. Um, um, I, I, yeah, Big Bang Nuclear is, so, so, um, BBN is mostly nuclear physics, um, but it tells you about how much, uh, I think, I think, uh, yeah, uh, um, yesterday you, you have learned a little bit about BBN, right? Um, basically BBN is mostly nuclear physics. It's really good in, uh, it's a really good prediction. Imagine like it's, it, it is, it was the first three minutes of, uh, of the universe and you can get a really good calculation out of BBN. It, it fits quite perfectly. Um, I think what BBN tells you is the um, is how much baryonic matters out there. Um, and then basically you just subtract, uh, you know, you know how much matter out there and you subtract the, um, uh, you know, the amount of baryonic matter and you left with dark matter. But that dark matter doesn't have to be wind. Um, but um, that's that's one thing that I that that I can say. But there are some model of whims. So this is the first order answer. The second order answer is there are some model of whims that that you know annihilates into certain particle even during BBN. Some models. And if you have that kind of model, you have to be careful because there you have some injection of you know new variants um, that might screw the BBN. So BBN can put some constraints on the uh, on some WIM models but if you win mo most of the WIM models are safe um, so that's yeah that's that's uh, yeah that's the second other question the second other answer to your question thank you I hope that helps okay thank you for the answer so maybe you can uh, take the question from Hermawan Raditiong although he's not here maybe Okay. Number nine. Yeah. Um, so I can take uh, the answer. I just read it. Um, so Hermawan Radio is still curious. Does the dark matter, will the dark matter annihilate to each other to or with? Um, um, depends on to or with. So if the dark matter annihilate, does, so it is the question is, does the dark matter annihilate to antimatter, the answer is yes in most models. So um, usually uh, what you have is dark matter um, annihilates, I, do I have, um, uh, yeah, empty space here. Um, okay, yeah, it's indirect, let's put it here. Um, so the, in, in the indirect detection, um, the dark matter will annihilate into um, standard model pair, but usually because most of the standard model particles, quarks or electrons or muon are charged. So it has to, and we know dark matter is neutral. And you know, electron, for example, is charged. So if you want the, if you want the dark matter analytes into electron, you have you cannot have dark matter analyte into just electron, but it has to be analyte to the pair, positron. Same thing with you know quarks and anti quarks. Quarks has a you know for example up quark has a charge of plus one third uh, sorry two third. The anti quark is a, uh, has a charge of minus one third. So yes, uh, dark matter has to annihilate to most in most model dark matter has to annihilate into 
uh, empty matter as well. And basically, that's actually the, the way we look for dark matter using under detection. We look not for the matter because there's a lot of matter out here, but we look for the empty matter. So we look for positron excess or we look for anti antiproton excess. Um, does the dark matter emulate into empty matter? That's slightly different question. So not with empty matter. That's slightly different question in some model, in most models. So um, in particle theory, there is something called baryon number and lepton number. Now baryon number, antimatter has anti-baryon number, lepton number has anti-lepton number, but there is a strong, uh, there is a strong hint or uh, on, basically we have never seen any baryon number uh, violation, lepton number violation. It's a, uh, it's like it's always conserved. Like our charts, the charts, the uh, you know the uh, the charts is always conserved, and this number always conserved. There are some models out there that say dark matter has baryon numbers, and it might in this case dark matter might annihilate with the anti anti matter, or you know the anti anti dark matter annihilates to anti uh, with annihilates with the matter. Um, but we haven't seen that. Well, basically, we haven't seen dark matter, so we don't know if it relates to with the anti matter or matter in, in that regards. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We really enjoy your lecture, and oh, I remind you about the. Oh yes, I I need, <laughs> yeah I I I even forget. Okay. Um, so one thing. Uh, so if you want to discuss with me, um, I forget to put my email. It just my my name is Raina Primulando, right? So R uh, Primulando. So just my first initial and my last name at uh, my university, uh, UNPAR. Dot AC. Dot ID. So you can email me here. R Primulando, my name at uh, yeah, it's it's name of my university, UNPAR. Dot AC. Dot ID. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing. I actually say a lot of things. Just, just, uh, just say like the velocity of dark matter is, uh, you know, uh, 300 kilometer per second. You know, and the n is something. So I have a homework for you. Two numbers should be. Hopefully, it's easy because I got you. Uh, you know, I got you uh, from you know uh, in the calculation. So I have a homework for you. Two numbers should be just one afternoon. Hopefully. Um, so you can try to work out, basically, uh, this is just to complete some of the calculations that I did uh, in this, um, in this uh, lecture. Um, I think the organizer uh, will tell you on how to submit the, uh, the homework, but the problems, you can see it at the, uh, at the, uh, the website. So in, inside the, um, inside the uh, you know, you look at the program and you see my name and then you see the homework right there. Yeah, there are two problems. Hopefully, it's not that hard. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we learned very much from you. And uh, thank you for all the participants for your enthusiastic uh, discussion today. And let's close this session. And we take, as always, we take picture before we uh, we separate. Hello? Hello? Apa, okay. Are you here? Uh, it's me, uh, Dr. Rulani uh, Sahan. Ah, Sahan, you are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I will take the picture. Uh, could you please turn on your camera? Uh, okay. There are four slides in my computer, so please uh, wait for a second. Okay, the first slide. First, uh, three, two, one. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Wait. Uh, three, two, one. Okay. The third one. Sorry to make you wait. <laughs> three, two, one. Okay. And the last one. Uh, three, two, one. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much for your uh, camera. Okay, thank you everyone. See you. you. It's <laughs> nice to uh, talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, you very much. Great lecture. Thank you.